Hello, the Facebook land. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tonight you're in for a big treat because we're going to learn lots of new things. And I know a lot of the people who follow our page and um, as well as Cindy's page are really into how dogs use their notes. And that's something we're going to focus on tonight, but it's going to be something that actually can help people. So not for just fun or sport, but something that actually can help someone save their life. So I know you've been waiting for this, but we have Cindy Roberts with us. She is a dear friend. She's a nose work enthusiast, and um, she does all kinds of things training-wise in Alabama, and I'm looking forward to seeing her soon. But tonight we're talking about how can a dog detect cancer and a passion project that she's been working on to really get this program going, and we're going to tell you all about it. Please feel free to ask questions throughout. I will ask some questions to get the ball rolling, but this is about you guys. So make sure to post your questions. And if you're watching this later, um, because this is recorded, then you can post questions later. And I know Cindy will chime in. And okay. before I forget, make sure to share this because some people may have forgotten. So you can hit that share button and let people know that you're watching this live. We'll probably go for 45 minutes to an hour so that people can get this information because I think it's really interesting. So. Enough about that. Let's get right into it, Cindy. All right. Cindy, I'm okay. so excited <laughs> um, that you, you know, took the time out of your day to do this with us. You do a lot of things nose work. That's how we right. met. Right. But this is a passion project for you. Can you yeah. share a little bit um, why this is so important to you before we get into the nuts and the bolts of it? Oh, wow. Let's just hit right into the heart of the emotions, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my mom, um, unfortunately had three separate bouts of cancer in her lifetime. Uh, it began with a melanoma on her leg, followed by uh, breast cancer with a double mastectomy, and then several years later, a completely unrelated case of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. um, she was diagnosed on a Tuesday and we lost her the following Monday. Wow. So my passion is to give people more than six days to be able to be with their loved ones. Absolutely. And from the first time she was um, diagnosed to, mm -hmm. you know, when you lost her, how long did that, how long was that period total? Oh, from the melanoma? Correct. Um, probably about 15, 20 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it, wow. none of it was connected. Um, a lot of times uh, breast cancer will come back and spread into other parts and lung is one of the areas that it does tend to go to the uh, lung and the brains. But this was completely unrelated to her breast cancer. Gotcha. And, you know, unfortunately, we are all touched by it. Um, you know, I, I also lost my mom to cancer. Aww. And um, and it's something that, you know, I'm definitely passionate about because, you know, all of us, whether it's, you know, a direct family member, friend, coworker, you just, you could like, all of us could name five to 10, if not more, you know, people that we actually know um, that have been through some form of cancer. And it's really important for people to know that there is you know, research being done and things yeah. to try to, you know, get us those early detections so that we do have more than a few days time to even try to, you know, tackle it, right? right. Or just enjoy exactly. our time together. Time is so precious with those we care about. Yeah. Um, so now that we, you know, we got all the heart out there, yeah. <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now to, okay. you know, get this program launched and how many dogs are involved. Just kind of give us a, a a bird's eye view of what you've got going on with this awesome okay. project. So right now we have 10 dogs uh, that we've been working with over the course of a year and a half um, and a couple of dogs a little bit longer. Uh, that's our personal dogs because, you know, we've been working with them from the beginning. Um, they have been trained uh, how to search. Now, yes, two of the dogs in my program that are mine um, are nose work dogs. So they know how to search. However, we have a special apparatus that the dogs have to learn to search on and that's the only thing that they have to search. Um, there's approximately, well, there's five holes on the training uh, rack that we use, but there's eight holes on the rack that we will use when we go into uh, a research study. Okay. So the dogs have to be trained to search every single position on the rack because we have to know for sure if that sample that is in that rack has cancer or not. So we're working with the dogs with a yummy treat, high value treats. You know, you know, work folks, you guys know all about that <laughs> uh, to make sure that they 
you know, position their nose over each slot and give it a good, good test. Um, there is a little bit of uh, convergence of the odor coming in from one to the other. So the dogs have to learn how to differentiate when it's slightly less potent in one hole, but stronger in another. Um, okay. And that's something that they would have to confront when we go through a cancer study. Um, and gotcha. we the samples. So right now we've been working on the dogs, getting them to work on the apparatuses that we have so that when the, the minute we get the, the first samples in, we can start loading them up and start pair, um, start, um, my brain just died. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> start imprinting the cancer odor on the dogs. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, so you've been doing this for how long? Like, when did you start? So we attended the cancer detection training program in uh, California at the end of, uh, I think it was 2015. Oh, wow. And, yeah. So uh, we came back and as soon as we, you know, it took us about three or four months to get everything together so that we could start working with the dogs. And we started with our personal dogs. Okay, um, that makes sense. Yeah. And then I've had students over the time ask if their dogs potentially could uh, be a participant in the program. And we brought those dogs in as well and started working them on the same patterns. Okay. So, so we have 10 dogs um, right now that are itching to go. <laughs> and we, I have had a meeting with um, a research oncologist here in town. Um, his specialty is ovarian cancer. And we're working with him to see if his, if his institution is willing to work with us. Okay. So there's that's really important to be able to work with yes. the medical profession. Right. Okay. So um, what we're going to be doing is we hope we can get enough um, of the ovarian cancer samples from uh, the patient's urine. Okay. And, you know, be able to look at it that way. But then we also have to have large quantities of people that are considered healthy who do not have any um, signs of cancer or any other diseases. And then we also have to proof the dogs off of people that have other diseases such as diabetes, high blood pressure, um, you know, any number of other things that could go along, or even someone that has a benign ovarian tumor. Hmm. So there's a lot of things that go into this search um, when we're looking for samples. Uh, so, you know, we need the malignant samples, of course, and then we need them from healthy controls, and then we need other disease controls. And we'll have to proof the dogs wow. of all of those. Yeah, you definitely have to proof mm -hmm. all those. And, you know, for those of us who do the companion sport nose work, yeah. You know, we do that too. Obviously, it's not as critical, <laughs> um, you know, because it's not research based, but we right. do the same thing. So we can really, you know, if you do that, you can understand what you're trying to do right. um, because there's certain variables that you need to make sure the dogs are clear um, in identifying the right source. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, okay. and then we'll also have to proof the dogs off of the containers that hold the samples, the gloves that were used from the person that's handling the samples. Um, the cotton swabs that are blanks themselves. I'm not sure what that noise was. I'm not sure if that's me. Or you. <laughs> and, you know, all those different variables. And then we have to proof the dogs off of, you know, if a dog accidentally has a crumb of treat on their mouth that falls into the sample holder, we have to proof them off of, you know, reacting to that and only go for the cancer. Wow. Yep. And do you have any idea how long that training process before you felt really solid is? Are we still in that phase? So when we have the cancer samples and then we start proofing against the others from the moment we receive our first cancer sample till the moment we're about ready to begin a double blind study, which is where no one in the room with the dogs um, or affiliated with the project here in Birmingham is aware of which sample is a malignant sample, which sample is a healthy sample, okay. or which sample is a, um, a disease sample. When we hit that point, we're looking at about nine to 12 months. Okay. Yeah. All right. And that seems, again, I'm comparing it to what I know of, you know, a right. sport dog, right? So right. that would be appropriate. Yeah. Um, and say that it, if we were to take a puppy that has never been trained how to do anything before, it would take about 18 months total. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so 
what kinds of dogs have you been using in the program, um, breed, size, age, besides your own personal dogs or yeah. student dogs? So, of course, um, the Nibs, my nine-year-old long <laughs> Chihuahua, some of you guys know him, uh, and Opie, or Obi, depending on which day of the week it is. Um, <laughs> so Nibbler is now nine. Obi is, uh, we're thinking five since he's a rescue. We're not 100% sure. Um, we've also had um, kettle dogs, um, Weimaraners, uh, what else? Um, Dobes, a um, lot of mixed breeds. Okay. Yeah, a lot of mixed breeds. So we're not actually using what you would consider a traditional detection dog. A lot of people think that you would go for, say, a Labrador or, and we do have some beagles. Um, <laughs> Stereotypical. <laughs> yeah. so you would expect to see a beagle or a hound like that into the program. But um, we use some non-traditional dogs. And the reason for that is because these are all volunteer dogs. We're not going out and purchasing dogs okay. for this program. They're all volunteers. Um, People who, like I, uh, have been touched by cancer in various ways, um, who said, hey, I think I've got a potential dog here. Let's, you know, I'd like to see what they can do. So um, we're a little different. Uh, a lot of other programs use solely beagles or solely Labradors. Um, we're kind of modeling our program a little bit after um, our trainer's program, where she had a variety of dogs as well. She had okay. Australian um, shepherds and German shepherds and um, some a couple of mixed breeds and some beagles and that kind of thing. Okay. And so how many other programs are out there that are doing this stuff that you're aware um, of? So there's, I would say, between 10 and 20 that okay. I'm aware of. There may be other programs out there that have not yet published uh, in the scientific journals. Um, so Auburn University has run a couple of cancer detection studies. PennVet um, with Dr. Cynthia Otto is a large resource for this. There's groups in uh, England, um, Israel, I believe, Japan. Uh, there's a wow. study in Japan on, I believe, stomach cancer. Okay. Um, yeah, so California, there's several. Canada, um, you know, just they're all over. It depends. Uh, I think there's a couple in South America as well. Okay. And do you find that they tend to focus on one type of cancer? Um, there's been a lot of focus on breast cancer, and I think that's because it's one of the more uh, common types of cancer that you see. And that's that's wonderful. Um, I hope that they are able to come up with a non-invasive way of detecting breast cancer. You know, we have mammograms and ultrasounds and all those other tools, but still it comes down to the point where um, to confirm it that they have to actually do a form of surgery and take a biopsy mm. from the patient. Um, some, some of the programs I'm working, I would like to work on is ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, okay. um, those cancers that we don't have screening tools for those mm. cancers that typically when they are discovered, unfortunately, it's too late to do much about them. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So we know that the dogs can find it from either breath, urine or blood plasma. Okay. And that's what we're here to prove. All right. And I know you've shared because you you've talked about your training facility, you know, in our one on one talks, um, you know, talk about how important it is that you have to have, um, you know, these special ways of caring for these samples mm -hmm. um, in order for this to be, you know, a pure search. Right. It's much more challenging than just, you know, handling essential oil. Yes. So, you know, if you spill this, you have cancer samples all over the floor and you obviously don't want that. No. Um, the can so in the programs that I've been involved with where we have had live samples brought in, the samples have come from the hospital in small, what we call aliquots. Um, these, you remember the little centrifuge tubes that most of us use when we're working on ground hides and nose mm -hmm. worms? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's a little okay. centrifuge tubes. Hmm. They'll, um, take say the urine, dip the cotton swab into it, then put the cotton swab in the centrifuge tube. And okay. that's what the dogs are scenting off of. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So um, the typically, and it depends on the institution, they typically want their people handling it because they've been through, you know, their laboratory techs, they've been through all the training and certification and oh my gosh, to get through uh, all the <laughs> approval processes. There's so many different certifications we have to go through each time we do a project. Wow. So, um, and it's on sample handling, how to take care of the dogs, all of those types of things. 
Oof. So yeah, yeah, it, it gets a little complicated, but the sample handling is usually done by someone that is a laboratory technician. And there's been a few times where we have actually handled the samples, but you know, we glove up, we put on the suit, the, the face mask and everything so that we don't potentially um, contaminate those samples. So it's not just training the dogs, it's actually no, training you training guys you. if it's that level, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we have um, a question from one of our viewers, Jennifer. Okay. Yeah. Um, and she's asking, you know, is this something that dogs could sense in other dogs? So we know that, there, that the different types of cancer that are in humans um, smell differently. However, oh, okay. Yes. So let's say breast cancer doesn't smell like lung cancer. Um, mm. Pancreatic cancer doesn't smell like bladder cancer to the dogs. Fascinating. So, I yeah. assumed it would be all the same. No. So that's why when we're looking at samples, we have to get from a certain demographic, a certain set of people, those that specifically have that type of cancer. I wow. didn't realize there's five different types of ovarian cancer. Whoa. Right. So they, you know, that's one of the things that we're working with with the researchers to identify which one is going to have the greatest impact on the largest population. So right. we'll probably, you know, be working on the one that seems to be most common, um, commonly found. Um, but for Jennifer's question about will we be able to sense in other dogs, there may be a bit of a common factor in the smell of cancer with a dog. Typically, once the dog's been trained on four to five different types of cancer, they can do what we call generalization. So okay. it's kind of like a dog and nose work where once they know birch, anise, and clove, they pick up cypress, you mm -hmm. know, for AKC. Or, they're like, this is different. Yeah. So they're like, yeah. hey, it's a novel odor. Maybe I'll get a treat for this. So it's somewhat the same for the dogs. Um, so it may be possible that a dog that's been trained on human cancer might be able to pick up the scent of... Uh, a cancer in the dog. We don't know. Nobody's put that to the test yet. Okay. So that might actually, now that Jennifer's asked, I kind of want to find that out. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, we all have, how many of us have lost dogs to cancer? I know over the course, you know, I started in dogs in 79, started training in 82. I've lost more than my fair share of dogs to cancer. Wow. So, yeah. So I would love to be able to have something so that my dog can say, Hey, you know, Fido over here has got a problem. Yeah. And, you know, there are so many dogs that um, do other jobs than just, right. you know, scent cancer. So, you know, I was thinking about all the dogs I've either met or heard of, you know, they search for snails, you know, yeah. so that when cargo comes over, they mm -hmm. search, um, you know, they can alert someone from seizures, yeah. uh, diabetic alert, right? Mm -hmm. They have to be trained. Some dogs naturally tend to communicate things and, and that's, you know, amazing. And if we notice it, um, but it makes all the sense in the world that we could do cancer or other things that, you know, we have this common denominator, right? Right. And you have to just get down to the variables. Like you're saying mm -hmm. this kind of cancer, this is yeah. what we're looking for. You can't just say, Oh, my dog searches for cancer. Right. right. <laughs> it's a very specific yeah. thing. Yeah. That's what I took away from that. I was like, Whoa. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So you can have a dog that, that searches for ovarian cancer and then they run across a prostate cancer sample and they're going to look at you and go, I don't know what this is. Um, or if they've been trained on enough other types of cancers in addition to the first one, then they may go, hey, this sounds a little familiar. You know, so this one may need to get checked out. Like, does this one pay as well? well does this one pay as well? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, th and that's the thing with, you know, dogs and their amazing noses. We have to learn how to teach them to tell us things. Yes. But they know it. They, yeah. they know the smells. It's just saying we want to know about it. Right. So tell us. Right. Right. So, so right now you've got 10 dogs in the program, varying yes. breeds. Mm -hmm. um, age wise, do they vary too since they're volunteer? Um, so the youngest, I believe, is just turned two. Okay. And um, we do have a 14 year old. Wow. Okay. Well, yeah, but that's that's one of our dogs. So, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, we, we had to start with what we had and, um, you know, which is why we have, you know, toy breeds, hounds, uh, herding breeds, working dogs. We, we've got the gamut. 
And are there certain things you're looking for in a dog to say this might be a candidate to help in the program? Yes, uh, a willingness to interact with people help. Okay. Uh, because there are several individuals that will be in in the search area when the dog is searching. So they have to be able to work with them. And I did mention that Nibbler is part of the program and he actually learned how to work through a lot of those issues. He's come a long way. <laughs> yeah, from, the, from the first day. And, um, and also I like a dog that snows to the ground a lot because that tells me that they're interested in scenting. Mm -hmm. um, food drive or toy drive is big. Mm -hmm. um, oddly enough, you would think that we'd want a high drive dog like a Malinois that could go for 15 Crazy, days. Crazy, yeah. <laughs> but we actually want what's called a medium drive dog, okay. which is typically what most of our pet owners have. You know, that the they, dog that they like, want to oh, live with, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do this, and I want to keep working because I know I'm going to get my toy or a treat. Um, and that really works out well for them. But yet, when it's not their turn to go search, they'll go lay down quietly in their crate. Gotcha. So we need dogs with an off switch. <laughs> for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. I have seen cancer detection programs where they had those high drive off the wall dogs and the dogs become neurotic after several weeks of not having everything, um, you know, to, to do for all day long. Cause it may be right. out of a 24 hour period, the dog may be worked over the course of four hours for about 15 to 20 minutes. And right. so those high drive dogs are just going to be sitting in their crate going bonkers. So right. they have a lot of energy and it's not yeah. expended in that. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And for people who, you know, for me, I'm going through a certification on carrot, you know, clover animal, mm -hmm. that, you know, the response tool. Right. And, you know, many people think, well, all dogs smell. And it's like, yes, right. <laughs> but when your dog walks into a new room, what mm -hmm. do they do? Right. Do they look at all of it? Do they listen for everything? They hear the airplane, they hear the building creak, right? Do they have to touch right. everything? Or is it like you're saying, instantly nose to the ground, nose on the person's shoe, yep. nose up the leg, you know, walking around, just right. checking everything out through their nose. And that's what you're looking for mm -hmm. in addition to some other right. things. Right. Um, is obedience important to this specific program when it comes to these dogs? Um, we like for them to have just the basic obedience. They don't have to be your arch dogs. Okay. Um, or a you know CD you know uh, just basically when we tell them to sit we love for them to sit because we like for the dogs to give us a formal response which is unlike what we do in nose work right uh, we'll train the dogs to either do a paw well the paw they actually do on their own but we'll ask for them to do a sit or a down at the odor okay um, the cancer odor and um, so they do need to have the basics to at least understand what what sit is when we ask them to do a sit. Right. Um, but most dogs, um, like the ones that we have that we start out, they're our personal dogs. They still do the look back, you know, like we get in nose work. Mm -hmm. um, some of them actually are developing a paw where they'll go and they'll, they'll paw over the, the sample okay. for us. So, so a more aggressive response is okay. So, you know, and it's not like this is a bomb, so it's not going to blow up on us. Um, and the way that the apparatus is set up, the dogs can't get to the samples and they can't contaminate the samples. Okay, that's really good. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So, Since you're dealing with the different <laughs> different variables, of, different you know, variables here. Yeah, <laughs> we've so. got a few more questions. So I'm going to yep. jump into those. Um, so you know, Jen wants to know: Do they have to have a history of intense scent work training in order to do this? No, actually, um, one of our dogs um, just is the second dog to someone that has a dog in the program and hasn't even started nose work class. Um, wow. we, we can train them on what to do with this. And then, you know, and we actually tra have trained a couple of dogs that actually did not have any nose work or scent work backgrounds. And they've done incredibly well working on the apparatus. Um, actually, in some instances, it was easier because we didn't have to train the dog. Not search, do not search the whole room. We're only <laughs> right. um, They're like, so, I could do more. <laughs> like, oh, but I could go find it on a chair. It's like, no, 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 it's not going to be on the chair. It's be right here. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'm going to share this one. This is more of a, um, a little bit of information. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Beverly, when her husband was um, had nose cancer, mm -hmm. um, you know, her dog, Junebug, would actually go up to his nose, not before, not before diagnosis, but as he was going through treatment and, yeah. you know, very interested in it. Yes. Um, and so that's, you know, people report things like that, like 
my dog was really smelling one area of my body all of a sudden. And mm -hmm. so it made me go get checked. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, they did, they're not formally trained, but something wasn't right. And we don't know what the dogs know, right? We don't know why they're telling us these things. Right. And, and actually that's how this science began was from all the anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence of people who say, Hey, my dog's been pushing on my breast and they go for their mammogram and lo and behold, they had a tumor that ended up being breast cancer. Or mm -hmm. say, my dog is trying to eat this mole that's on my arm, you know, and he's never done that before. And then they go get it checked out and it's some type of uh, skin cancer or a melanoma. And, you know, so all that evidence came together and that's when uh, the researchers were like, maybe there's something to this. And that's when they started, you know, looking around for dog trainers that could help them mm -hmm. in this quest. So you guys, when your dog's smelling you somewhere, don't freak out. Yes. <laughs> I was in, when I was in training, um, we knew that the dog uh, that came into the room, her, um, when she, she actually had been able to detect cancer on people, not just mm -hmm. from the sample rack. And they said, if she sits, that's her indication. And she would like, when they would take them out to a park or something, the dog may find somebody and go sit in front of them. Well, I'm sitting there and she comes and trots into the room and does an immediate U-turn, you know, what we call a head snap, comes and sits right in front of me. And so I was, I was like, um, do I need to go to the doctor? And they're like, no, her tennis ball's up under your chair. And so, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I, you know, I had a client, um, who had a diabetic alert dog and the dog would alert on other people. Yeah. Um, it was not just alerting to her and that was really hard to deal with. Right. So, you know, it's important that these dogs know when they're working yeah. <laughs> and when they're not. And then they're not. So, and there are some programs, I think there was a program in Florida once upon a time that was scanning for skin cancer. They would have the person come lay down on a very low table and they would have the dogs walk around the table and scent on the person. Mm for this, you know, the cancerous mole or spot or whatever it is. Right. So wow. We, we don't do that. We're, we're looking for urine, blood or, or breath and, um, and our dogs will send on that. So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, you know, once they've been through one or two different types of cancer, if they start actually working on people, um, alerting on people. Um, right. So, you know, at that point, nobody may want to volunteer when I trial my dogs. So. <laughs> Well, speaking of that, since some of yeah. these dogs are actually doing for sport as well, right. um, what are some things that you do or do you do to differentiate what they're working on? Um, so they actually have a separate harness. Okay. Um, all the dogs in the program work on a Julius harness. And, you know, we, we've got the cute little patches on their medical scent detection dog and the name of the program on it. Um, my dogs, when they're trialing in nose work or scent work are on flat buckle collars. Okay. And so they know it's an equipment change difference. The mm -hmm. command is different. So when I'm searching a nose work or scent work, the command is find it. When we're working on the dogs on uh, the rack, the command is sniff it. Okay. So different commands and the dogs actually know how to differentiate because they we don't do it in the training room where we do our nose work training. They're in a separate room. Okay. Um, so those of you that may have seen some of our news articles, we do it in the larger room because we have to set up for the cameraman. Uh, <laughs> so when we're working the dogs that are actually in the office area, uh, okay. away from the separate training area. So we try to put as many different uh, changes and context for the dogs so they know that this is what it is. And the apparatus wouldn't be yeah. present if you yeah. were searching for an essential right. oil. Um, so it stays in the storage room until we're actually training on it. And the dogs don't have access to it otherwise. And we definitely never put a nose work hide on any of our that equipment. Right. Yes. Because yeah. you want, you know, you really have to be pure about this. Yeah. This is this makes me think of, you know, any of our detection friends who do, right. you know, drugs or, or bombs, you know, they have mm -hmm. to be very clean right. about their work when they're training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. we we can't have dogs just alerting on random on random items no. yeah or yeah. similar things absolutely we're lucky in this um you know i know like people that do um hrd dogs you know they can't participate in dogs since okay so tell us what hrd is human remains discovery i think is what it is okay gotcha um, the other name for them most people know is cadaver dog yeah so those dogs they don't want them um going into a scent sport and just like the police they can't take their narcotics dog into a scent sport because eventually they will end up in court 
And the, you know, one of the uh, attorney, the defense attorney is going to go, what odors does your nose, does your dog know? And they'll go through the list of, you know, the different narcotics and they go, and it's virgin clove. And they'll go, ah, well, what could, is it possible that there could have been something that smelled like that? Could they have candy in the car or something like that? Right. And it would get the case thrown out of court. Um, right. So you can't dual purpose those dogs for this. Gotcha. But with the cancer items, um, we actually can because to date, we've not found anything that smells like the odors that we use in the sport. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And those guys, the, the other dogs who are working, they can do it when they retire. <laughs> they when they retire, sport. they get to come and have fun with us. Right? Totally. And they can do yeah. it for the sport. Right. Um, but, you know, dogs' noses are so amazing. I mean, there's just so much we don't even know. Oh, I know. Um, about what they could tell us if we knew how to ask. Yeah. I was giving a presentation uh, a few weeks ago. And I brought up the fact that a dog can smell one drop of blood in the volume of two Olympic sized swimming pools. And so someone stuck up their hand and they said, yeah, but can't a shark smell one drop of blood in 10 miles of ocean? I said, yeah, but my trainers don't want to work with sharks. They like to keep their fingers. <laughs> right there. I mean, um, they are guinea pigs that are um, bomb de detection guinea pigs. You know, they go out and look for landmines. Right. And they do rats too. Yeah. Um, so anything that's lightweight. Yeah. And you know, so I mean, there's other animals that may have better olfactory senses than our dogs, but so far the dog is the one that we can train to give us a response. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yes. And, um, <laughs> and think about lifespan too. Yeah. Right. So that's important that, you know, you're doing all this training, um, with the exception of obviously personal dogs that are, you know, are helping get this yeah. going. Um, you definitely want as much time as you can with these dogs yeah. because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of it time and money, um, mm -hmm. you know, and learning for the human to get to this point. Right. Um, so yeah, that's yeah. so many things to take into account when it comes to this. It's not just, right. you know, Oh, I just put my dog on cancer cells today and we're yeah. going to go out and find it. <laughs> it's not, is that how it works? Yeah, no, you don't take them out to the mall after you've trained them on this. Uh, mm -hmm. Hoping that you can, you know, and and I do have, you know, we're we're have very happy once the dog has learned how to detect it. Um, but the reality is, is that this is a very sick person that they just alerted us to. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so it's like, yay, my dog found cancer. It's like, oh, and then the implications hit you. My dog just found cancer on somebody. Right. It's 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 pretty bad. But when you think that our dogs can find it as early as stage zero and stage one before it breaks out and starts call, you know, just going rampant all over the body. Um, we, I hear somebody in the background back there. <laughs> but we can get the dog or anything. To, uh, no. <laughs> but um, but no. So. If they can detect it that early, then what we have to do is we have to have the doctors who are willing to go in search of it mm. to find it. Um, there was a, a study done a while back. I believe it was a, a bladder cancer study. And it was they were checking for recurrence of bladder cancer in so many individuals. And the dogs kept alerting on some samples, like mm. three samples. And they called the research team. And they're like, hey, are you sure these are not malignant samples? And they're like, yeah, no, it's um, they're 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 just healthy samples and like our dogs are alerting on them. And so they, they followed up with the three individuals. And I, I think one person developed a reoccurrence of the cancer within six months. Mm. Another one was like nine to 12 months later. And then the third one was about 18 months later. Mm. So the dogs knew before, well before most of the medical imaging could find it. And that actually becomes a problem is what happens if we find it, and the doctor says, I don't know where it is. Right. So, you know, you just created a lot of panic in a person. Um, Absolutely. It's things that, you know, and it's those types of implications that we have to consider when we're going through this. It's not just, hey, it's all fun and games. We're training dogs to go do this. But then it's like, there's the real world application of what happens if the dog alerts and the doctor's like, we've searched and we can't find it. Well, then we want to hope that the dog gave a false alert. And, but, you know, I mean, if that was me, I'd be going back every three months when I need a new scan, I need a new scan, let's do something. Absolutely. Yeah. And is that something that impacts the dogs at all to your knowledge of, you know, 
obviously they can't realize the full implications, but it's, it makes me think of like, you know, the HRD dogs and mm -hmm. um, maybe dogs who are doing like search and rescue in that realm that it's, you know, it's a smell that could cause yeah. death, right? Well, Do you notice any changes in that? So not in the dogs. Um, it's more, the implication comes from the handler because, and you know, as we all know, the everything transmits down the leash to the dog. Especially if these well, are their companion dogs. These aren't yeah. just and these are companion dogs. dogs. These are not, you know, your bomb sniffing dog that washed out of the program because they didn't like electric doors or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, or at least not yet. So, <laughs> um, so the implication is, is actually coming in from the person. Where we have problems is when we're doing a double blind study and we don't know if the dog actually alerted on the cancer sample you you know the dog's expecting to get a war rewarded when mm. they, they give their alert right gotcha so what we're um what i've written into my protocol is that we have a known cancer sample set up in the next room so we lead that we give the dog verbal praise for alerting at the, the the rack and then take them around to the room where we know the cancer sample is get them to alert on that and then we give them their treat and toy Gotcha. So you have like yeah. some recovery area. Yeah. It's, it's a recovery area because after a while, these companion dogs are going, wait a minute, I'm not getting any rewards, but I'm alerting, I'm finding things. Um, so that's how we're going to combat that problem. Right. And we really need that rate of reinforcement to be high. So yes. if every now and then I don't get a, right. you know, a cookie, I'll be yes. okay because I'll get mm -hmm. it in a minute. That's really yes. smart mm -hmm. because, you, you know, you have to be careful with your study, but you also need your dog to know they did the job. Right. Right. To the so, best, best of your knowledge, right? To the best of our knowledge, we want the dogs to know that they did the right thing. Um, and, you know, in training, toward the end of the training, before we start doing the, the single blind study and the double blind study, we actually will put uh, a blank rack out. Mm. You know, so it may have types of urine samples or, or whatever samples we're working on, but the malignant sample will not be present. Mm. So that they get used to going, hey, it's almost like doing a blank room for NW3, right? Right. You don't do it very often. You don't do it often. No. <laughs> but you do it so the dog's like, wait a minute, I didn't find anything. Um, like and that's weird. Yeah. And ideally, we don't want the dog to give us a, a false alert on right. that. And yeah. we also so need the handler work. to have that experience. Exactly. Too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not trying to convince them there's something right. there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all know we try to talk our dogs into things, right? We do. We love our dogs, and especially if these are companion handlers, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So, and this is, you know, a bit of, um, you know, the the citizen scientist coming out. Um, you know, I started off going down the, the route to be a veterinarian, and, you know, due to family issues, had to stop when I was supposed to go to vet school. Um, I didn't know that. that. That's fascinating. Yeah, I'll have to tell you about it next week. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a bit long, but um, but this is my chance to hop back on the the science panel again. So. Absolutely. Well, and if someone's got to start it, right? So yeah. we can't we can't you know if we feel like this is something that's really important, we can't just sit back. We have to take right. action, and that's yeah. really important. So, so I want to open it up for questions again um, because. I want you guys to get information out of this. This has been a wealth. I've learned so much, Cindy. <laughs> I knew I would. I knew I would. I, I knew I only know a tiny, tiny amount. Um, but it's so good for people to learn about it and to share this knowledge. It's still really in its infancy. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much more that we need to learn. But we have to have programs like what you're trying to you know, do with these dogs, these wonderful people who have allowed these dogs to do this and, mm -hmm. and take the time to do it because they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Yes. All of our volunteers are purely volunteers. They pay for their gas to get the dogs back and forth to training. Um, they provide their own treats for the dogs. You know, we keep a supply of cheese and, you know, some, some items around for the dogs, but this is all a volunteer basis. Nobody's making any money off of this and except for the research guys, you know, um, you know, we've we've got a couple of campaigns going to try to raise funds um, because we found actually um, typically in science, the, the researcher comes up with a proposal and he turns it over to someone and says, hey, I would like for you to contribute X number of dollars so I can try to do this program. We're going about it a little backwards. We're saying, hey, here's a program. Here's some money. <laughs> we started, we'll find matching funds to go with it to complete the, the budget. Gotcha. It okay. Worked better to get our foot in the door in some of these places. 
Sure. Yeah. Right. Because if they're not totally invested in it, it's, it's right. a hard road yeah. because you're having to explain it to them and sell it to them and really get that buy-in. It is. And um, a lot of the grants that are out there are for pharmaceutical development, not actually for detection. Gotcha. Yeah. So well, hopefully we'll see that change with more knowledge out there. I hope so. Um, it would be great if we didn't have to do any more fundraisers and that they go, oh, well, NIH has a couple of grants out there we can apply for and see if we can qualify for those. Absolutely. So, but yeah. It's a community effort. Um, you know, uh, I'm the last person that wants to put my hand out and go help. But um, I know that very much about you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's that's, not, that's it's not, not easy. Right? No, you, no it it's like not. You would just fund it yourself and call it a day. Yeah, so if I had that $150,000 sitting in my bank account somewhere, um, I would probably be in the islands. No. Um, <laughs> no, I'd be doing this, but the money would be written in a check going to the institution to work with. Um, Absolutely. This, you know, I'm, I may end up on a cardboard box under the freeway somewhere with my dogs, but by golly, we're going to do this. Absolutely. And that's Absolutely. what you need, that you need to say, yep, we're doing it. I don't know we're how. Doing. I don't know how. I don't know how. how. Yeah, absolutely. The how yeah. comes later. So yeah. I want to dig into that and I'll make sure to share um, your GoFundMe link when we okay. wrap up. Um, so you're trying to raise $150,000. I mean, that's pocket change, right? Like once you get that, right? No big so deal. <laughs> there are several uh, groups uh, out there that will match funds that we're able to raise. Okay. And, but we have to have the project approved. So, we're currently in the early stages of writing up the proposal with the researcher that we've talked with and the number of samples that we need uh, to be able to do this successfully. Uh, he's working out the logistics of how to obtain those samples. And it's completely fascinating how they're going to obtain this. I never would have thought of doing this, but uh, you know, that's why he's uh, the Mr. Dr. PhD. Yes. And uh, it's just, and then you have to pay for the statisticians and the people that's going to be handling the samples and the collection. And then you have to pay for the rental of the freezers to keep the samples in until you're ready to use wow. them. And it's, it's larger than I ever thought. Um, and now I know why people say we need $2 million to do this study. Um, you know, so my little bit here is just doing this. Um, so a start. It's, it's, it is, it's a drop in the bucket, but it's our good faith to the research institution to say, hey, we know this can work. We know we can do this together. We need a partnership because, you know, it's you can't just walk down to Walgreens and buy a cancer sample. And right. it takes hundreds of samples to train the dogs. Um, Absolutely. And so you have to go to somebody with a large institution. So but I see we have a couple of questions coming in. Oh, go for it. Yeah, go for it. All right. So Tammy says, if they are trained on multiple types of cancer and they alert, do you know which cancer they found? So there's been discussion on, um, can we tell them to do a sit for breast cancer, a down for ovarian, mm. a fall for this, and a different type of thing? There actually are a couple of groups out there whose dogs are trained on multiple cancers. One only screens firefighters. He's up in Canada. Hmm. Um, they do not, his dogs are not trained to differentiate. So what we're looking at doing is saying, these dogs are trained on this cancer. These dogs are trained on this cancer. So some teams. We just have different teams and yeah. we would run the different teams over the samples. So we know that this project we're, we're going for right now is an ovarian cancer study. So all the dogs will be trained on ovarian cancer and that's all that there's going to be. Now, if we had a screening service, which is eventually a goal I would like to have um, to where the dogs can do this. Then I would have, you know, a handful of dogs trained for each different type of cancer. So the sample would come in, we'd put it in, in the rack and just run the dogs on it that are trained on the different types of cancers. So and then the question is, well, what happens if all of the dogs alert on it? Then the chance is it's a type of cancer that we haven't seen yet. Right. If everybody's alerting on it. Yeah. So, um, you know, so that would be, and, guess, yeah. And to continue that for Tammy's question. So when you go in and do a screening, let's say mm -hmm. you have three dogs with you that day, yeah. they all three run the exact same setup. So yeah. let's say the hide, you know, the hide, the cancer cells are in the, you know, last area. Right. 
you run all three on that same setup. Yes. Wow. So okay. all three run on the same. So it's a, but it's a different sample. So let me try to explain this. Yeah. Um, when, when we get the urine cup, it's, you know, so many milliliters. Okay. We, we have them split that up into the small little centrifuge vials, right? Okay. And so each centrifuge vial produces maybe five samples, you know, where we dip the cotton tip into it. And then um, each dog sits, you know, goes and sits on the rack. We take that cancer sample out, dispose of that particular uh, cotton swab, get a new sample from the same urine, Mm. Put it back in there for the next dog. So that way there's no cross contamination when we're actually doing it as a screener. Gotcha. But that specific but that target same, stays yeah. in the same pod, it if you will. Stays in the same spot. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Then, then it would be okay, all three dogs alerted on position five. Gotcha. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. We have a question from Arlene. I'll put it up on the mm -hmm. screen. Okay. Um, so would it be biomedical companies that would possibly help out or pharmaceutical companies? So here, here is what my proposal has always been, is let us train the dogs on the type of cancer that your company is working with. And then let's figure out what it is in that breath, blood, plasma, or urine that the dog is scenting. And let's start stripping out the different components of it until you nail down exactly which one it is. And then you guys go develop a test for that. Gotcha. Okay. So use the dogs to get started on that um to be able to do it and um so there's been there's there's been some some look into that um most of our researchers say that they get their money either from the national institute of health or through pharmaceutical companies that they work with mm -hmm. uh looking for different types of um you know ways to treat these cancers uh what we're asking them to do is take a step back and say instead of looking to treat it let's look to find it and then you can apply your treatments to it Right. And so, and for her, she's asking, you know, donation wise, yeah. that's, and that's what you're saying. That would probably be well. Um, another, another avenue to uh, approach is look for a company that uh, may not have the best public relations right now due to problems. The, the one that stands out to me would be like the, uh, the company, is it uh, Johnson and Johnson who does the uh, life, is it glycophate also known as Roundup? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Causes lymphoma, so they may say, "Hey, we're helping this this group of dogs learn how to detect lymphoma early, so that we can try to help those people that may have been affected by the product." Right. You know, I'm, that's, I'm not saying we've approached them. I'm not saying we've done any of that. <laughs> but this would be kind of an example. For example, we'll yeah. Familiar with. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Maybe my next letter that goes out. Yeah. So, <laughs> Look for a negative PR because yeah. that's the thing. Like. You know, they, they need to do the right thing. And that's right. one way they could do it for sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to see if we have any other questions. I don't see any others yet. So get them in while you can. It does um, take me to take Come on, guys. <laughs> um, so these funds you're trying to raise, um, you know, anyone who, you know, has the means to assist, please do. Um, any amount will help right? Because it takes right. a village. Um, it doesn't have to be any large amount. And if you cannot, you can right. share, right? So share the information, share this uh, yeah. live broadcast, share the you know replay, talk about it to people, because yeah. we need to bring awareness mm -hmm. that this is something that's out there. You know, right. some, so many times when you hear a cancer diagnosis, you feel helpless. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much that can be done, especially if we can know as early as possible right. um, through the use of this program. You know, so one of the things that, that I've worked on, and I am going to be forming a 501c3 to help out with this so that, you know, that we haven't got it formed yet, but uh, we're working. That takes a little while. It's not, that's not easy. Well. It, yeah. To go through the process. But one of the things I want to call it, um, something to do with six days, six days foundation. Um, my mom lived for six days after her, her last cancer diagnosis. And I said, if everybody who views the story, listens to the story, reads about the story could just kick in $6, then that would get us there. Um, it's, 
it's not, I mean, I know $6 to some people could be, you know, all the difference between making a meal for the whole day. And I understand that. So just share the, um, the story with your friends because, you know, somebody may be, be able to do better. But $6 is the cost of lunch going out uh, to a fast food restaurant. Actually, depending on what you're buying, it may be a little bit more. But, right. you know, if you can just skip that one fast food restaurant and brown bag it for the day, then that's $6 that can go to the, the study. Absolutely. Yes. It's, um, you know, and if, and I've had a lot of people that have been able to uh, donate more than the $6. And that is always, um, it blows me away. Uh, I'll open up an email and it says, hey, you've just gotten this much money from this person. And I am so humbled by the people who think enough of the dogs and put their trust in us to do this. Uh, we already want to do this. Absolutely. We've got a couple questions here from a, it looks like a super fan, Brittany. Brittany. Um, so hey, let Brittany. me show you the first question. She said, Hey, and then this is her first question. She may have jumped in a little late. Um, okay. but if you can, a couple other people may have as well. So what's her primary cancer you're focusing on? Um, or just can cancers in general. She's proud of you, which we all are proud of you. This is just Thank amazing. You, so, um, the goal for this one, uh, this time is going to be ovarian cancer. And, uh, we're doing this because some of the groups that out there that are detecting cancer, that's not one of the cancers that they're looking for. Um, I want to do something to help people that to find their cancer early when there is no screening available. You know, we have PSA tests for um, prostate cancer. We have the mammograms for breast cancer. Um, I would like for us to be able to find things uh, that we don't have a screening tool for at the moment. And, um, and usually those are the ones that end up claiming so many lives, uh, prostate, I mean, not prostate, uh, pancreatic, um, even gallbladder cancer, because a lot hmm. of times you find that until it's secondary. Hmm. And, you know, they go in and they remove the gallbladder thinking it's that issue, but it's already spread throughout the abdomen or whatever. Wow. Um, you know, those types of things, um, things that we normally don't, of course, I would love to be able to get a lung cancer study going, um, you know, for mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but, oh, okay, I'm going to get choked up. So we'll, we'll, move <laughs> we'll keep moving along. So Becky has a question for you as well. Since there are other programs uh -huh. um, and dogs that are already detecting cancer, why do you have to work so hard to prove again that dogs can detect cancer? Hey, amen, Becky White. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. We are with you. Um, right now, the FDA doesn't think that what we're doing is worth it. And it takes a lot of scientific research to back up um what we know we know the dogs can do it but you know they they want better numbers they want higher numbers um they want more recent research they want greater quantity of dogs there's actually been a, a research study out there where they took a look at all the different um dog cancer detection studies and they said what needs to improve well one of the things they said was there was a lot of um studies out there that only used one or two dogs they said you need to have a larger number of dogs, a larger population of dogs to be able to do this. You need to have um, different types of cancers. A lot of people are focusing only on one thing or the other that is such a, um, a problem in their region. Uh, like uh, the, the Japanese are working on detecting stomach cancer because that's a huge issue, especially after the reactor accident a couple of years ago. Um, they're seeing a, a rise in uh, stomach cancer after that. Mm. So, you know, they're focusing on those other items. Um, and like I said, the group that's up in Canada, they only work on firefighters and they only detect a certain type of cancer that's commonly found in firefighters. So we need to be able to spread our wings a bit and, and um, look at other types of cancers to be able to, to work on. And is there a group or an organization that kind of connects you with all these people since you could share that knowledge? Not at the present time, no. All right, put it on your to-do list. <laughs> you not have extra five minutes a day, right? <laughs> exactly, or the, like, we'll find you a volunteer. <laughs> yeah. So there, I mean, it's amazing, The where I went for training, she was the first person to standardize a training process for the dogs. Hmm. And that's what we were taught from. Um, I've been in other projects where the, the lead trainer decided to use something that was contrary and the results were not as good. Mm. So she actually has a tried and true process that works 
And that's the process we're using. We'll tweak it and modify it over time as we say how, how what works for our dogs. Of and course. Our dogs. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, um, it's, it's, there needs to be standardization. There needs to be, um, a certification for the dogs. It's, it's really odd. Um, you may have read about Angus, the C. diff detection dog in Canada. Um, he and his team were just, they just finally came up with a, um, with a certification for he and his, the other dogs that are up there detecting C. diff. Um, I may be able to talk to, because I know that the whole team behind it, actually they're, they're no sport people. Um, the lady that trained Angus was in my CNWI class. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so I know her from that. And then the gentleman that helped to um, develop the certification for the dogs is a well-known nose work instructor, but he's also done, you know, military dogs and arson detection dogs, et cetera, et cetera. He's world renowned. And uh, we may be able to, once we are able to get the dogs up on a couple of different cancers, uh, get him to come in and help us set up a certification process for the dogs. That'd so be amazing. The process, the training and everything that we go through. And then once we have those those building blocks in place, then we actually have a industry that that we're making off of this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, this may not happen in my lifetime. You know, I'm, I'm going to be uh, 53 this year, uh, and who knows how long we're on this earth. But right. uh, you know, if I want to get at least put a block in that foundation to get all this going. Yeah, you have too much to live for, Cindy. It's good you're just going to keep just. Building all those blocks in place, hopefully yeah. ones will come faster as that foundation is built for so. sure. Brittany had a follow-up question uh -huh. um, about, you know, it's awesome that you guys are working on ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. um, can you reach out to Alabama Med? Sounds like she's got, you know, some connections there. Yeah, so um, we definitely will be reaching out to them. I'm going to try to go through the process that I have now with the gentleman that we've talked to already. Um, I'm sure you probably have some names you could send me. You know how to get that <laughs> with me. So send me, send me some names I can go approach down there. Um, you know, I, I need to take a vacation at some time this year, and I may turn this into a working vacation if I have to go down there um, to be able to talk to somebody. So, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder. Will, I will work with anybody in any state, any country. Yes, <laughs> so badly. Absolutely. And that's why we want to have you on and we want to talk about it because the more people that are, you know, on this process, right? Mm -hmm. So right. let's talk about how people can help and then we'll wrap up. And if people have questions down the road, please post them. Cindy yep. keeps an eye out for those things. She is great at responding. Um, she works really hard at this. She literally doesn't have time for the to-do list I gave her. Um, so what, list? <laughs> what list? Where? What list? <laughs> Number one, obviously, contribute to the GoFundMe, that is going to help get people to say, yes, I want to work with you because they're bringing the full package and they can get matching funds. Uh, the second way to help is to share the message. So yeah. share it with anyone who might be of interest. Um, maybe you know someone in different industries, talk about it. It's mm -hmm. that awareness. You know, People have to hear things seven to 10 times to really remember and it doesn't have to be forced it's just casual conversation right, right. Um, and then if there's anything you can do to you know contribute to city especially locally i'm sure if she needs help right. you need to ask her she's not going to ask you <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you know she wants to get this program and she's willing to do as much as she possibly can mm -hmm. um, even go on a facebook live uh to share this information so right. remember even six dollars because it was six days that she knew right. she had for her mom. So anything else, Cindy, you want to share before we wrap up this beautiful conversation? Thank you guys so much for attending. Well, I want to thank everybody who um, stuck out and uh, stuck around to listen to all this. Um, this is a passion of mine. If you talk to me in person, um, you may want to have an exit strategy <laughs> because I may tend to talk your ears off. About <laughs> Avoid us when we're together. Then. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, and just share the information. We have so many people out there in the dog community who know people and they may have people who know people. And that's how, you know, just the word of mouth. And I may have a researcher call me up one day and go, Hey, I heard about this Facebook live thing that you did. I I'm interested in doing this study. Um, let's talk. 
And, and that's what I'm interested in. Um, in fact, I need to get in touch with a couple of folks in uh, Georgia to go over a special project that we may be trying to do over there as well. So it, it's, it's another one of those, I need to find an extra five minutes in my day to actually make that happen. But it's, it's a worthwhile um, endeavor. Um, and I think you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Probably. Probably. So, so, um, so um, where, do, where do they go? So the GoFundMe, is there any yeah. other way that you want people to connect with you if they have some way that they can support you? Okay. So some people have an aversion to donating through GoFundMe because they say that they, they don't like the platform fees and the processing fees, um, that they want 100% of the money to come straight to the program. And that's fine. Um, we actually have a link on our website where people can submit um, monetary uh, contributions um, on the website. And oh, sorry, Arlene, I was reading what you just said. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so they can actually go on my website and send it. Yes, there is going to be the PayPal processing fee to process the credit card. But when you're a small business like I am with just the dog training, um, PayPal is actually one of the least expensive options for us since we don't process, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Right. So, um, and to be honest with you, the Go, the GoFundMe platform is a good one since they do help to spread the word. And, you know, I don't really mind giving them an extra couple of pennies for every dollar, uh, for them to be able to spread the word on this project. So either way works for me. Um, you get a nice little thank you note from me personally. And we're working on getting some gifts to send out to some folks. I've got some volunteers that are wanting to work on nice little ways of us to be able to really show our appreciation for everything that people are doing for us. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, Cindy. Thank you. thank you for all the people who tuned in. Share, share, share like crazy. Uh, let's make sure we support this so that she can continue on and all those goals that she has to make this possible. Well, I appreciate it. And thank you for that great idea, Arlene. I, I appreciate that. I'm going to do that tomorrow, I promise. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. All right. Bye thanks, now. guys.